There I go talking like I've never been on Zoom before. <laughs> Everybody, uh, it is really, really, really cool to see you all tonight. Um, I'm Alderman Andre Vasquez of Chicago's 40th Ward. Uh, I've got a presentation and kind of talk through, um, you know, something that we actually would love your help on. Um, but I just wanted to articulate how particularly geeked I am to be on Shy Hack Night. So for a little bit of background, even before getting elected, like, so I think about now, like maybe four years ago, um, as I was just community organizing, I kept trying to, you know, I've got a little bit of background because I used to work for at t for about 12 years. So thinking about how we can engage people and make it convenient for them was something that's always been kind of core to, to my values. So yeah, even back then, I wanted to find ways to kind of connect. And so now being in office and having a better understanding of like government how it works and sometimes doesn't work. Um, I, I feel really fortunate to be able to present in front of you all. So I'm gonna share the screen out. Oh, by the way, I've, I've got our director of policy, Jeffrey Cubbage here. Hey, Jeffrey, uh, we have a slide where we do the intro part. So <laughs> we'll get to that too. Uh, let me make sure I can get the screen up here for y'all. All righty, cool. Give it up for Canva. All right. Cool, so you all can see this flying by, right? Is that correct? Thumbs up? Yep, yeah. yep, we're getting the rewind. Great, yeah. <laughs> so I'll just fast forward that in slow motion. All right, so uh, we uh, originally I was gonna present on budget and campaign finance. I then in trying to put everything together, realized I was like brain dumping a whole bunch. And so I think we would be best served to kind of focus on the one thing we wanted to bring up, but then open up the Q&A for any questions that people may have. Um, so here we go. So first, uh, the agenda of what we're gonna present, we've got introductions, then we're gonna talk through like what open government means, because it's very core to what we do here in the 40th Ward Office, um, what that looks like in philosophy and in practice, and then talk about budgets. And we wanna provide, excuse me, some background on city council as it pertains to budgets, as well as the public, and then um, identify or, or share with you all where we need your help in kind of talking through it. So I'm Alderman Andre Vasquez. I was elected in 2019 after defeating a 36 year incumbent asterisk who also put up a million and a half dollars to try to stop us from winning. Uh, but here we are. I'm a democratic socialist. I'm also the treasurer of the Latino caucus, the secretary of the progressive caucus, the vice chair of the reparations subcommittee of the health and human relations committee uh, and the vice chair of special events and the cultural affairs committee. So the business card is deep. Uh, and also I was in a prior career, a state level executive at a global telecom company. So I went from selling phones at AT&T to becoming a manager, then going into account management for internet and cable, and then ultimately becoming like a area manager for marketing for internet and cable for the whole state of Illinois. Um, so I often think about, cause uh, you know, when I started at at and is when we first went from palm, like held phones to smartphones and like screens and data. And so for me, I kind of like grew and evolved as the devices did. Um, and that's fueled a lot of how I look at what we can do. Uh, so Jeffrey, I will hand off to you to do your intro. Uh, that's all right, you got the intro. Um, so anyway, we work on a number of different things in house. Um, and a lot of the stuff we've been trying to do has been bringing a little modernization both to city services like why do you still have to get this piece of paper signed and deliver it to city hall in person to get a permit kind of issues um, but then also looking at how we can use data and you know software in a more sophisticated way when we're looking at legislation and some of the things that are bulleted there are um, projects we're working on where we're doing that where we're looking at uh, fines and fees that the city issues um, and getting a hold of like really the comprehensive data set of who do we write tickets to, what do we write those tickets for, what does the heat map look like when you you know see what zip codes and areas we're doing it in, things like that. Um, you know, looking at that data in ways that it hasn't been before. So um, it's exciting to do. However, the alderman only gets a staff of three. That's what the city gives you is uh, three staffers, and none of us are uh, programmers or uh, um, terribly sophisticated. So we do a lot with Excel, and then we do a lot with volunteer teams. Uh, which is what brings us here tonight. Awesome, thank you. All right, let me make sure I got this going. 
Awesome. So first, I want to introduce you to the concept of open government, which is something that guides how we work in the 40th office, uh, 40th ward office. So government, people tend to look at government as like these elected folks from on high that must know something more than everybody else. Uh, and kind of there's been this dynamic over generations of viewing government that way. Now, what we look at in the 40th ward is that it's actually the opposite, right? That we, all government employees, whether elected or not, are ultimately employed or elected by the people, that what funds our paychecks are the taxpayer dollar. And as such, uh, and even independent of that, government is ultimately your vehicle through which you can cause the change you want to see in the world. But because people aren't terribly tied, engaged, or educated on how their government works, uh, and that's intentional, we believe, it keeps people separated from what they're able to do. So ultimately, government is your vehicle. You should be in the driver's seat and you own it. Uh, and that's something that's very vital to how we look at government and how we move forward. Uh, we believe open government to be uh, ideally accessible, accountable, and transparent. And that's uh, what I ran on in coming into office to make sure that people, regardless of, of ideology, regardless of people's perspective, understand that government is a tool through which they can help realize the things they want to see. Uh, through getting people to understand the concept of open government, it allows for the ability to build people power through civic education, uh, as well as through convenient engagement. So in order for the government to work ideally the way one would want in a democracy, people have to understand how government works and it has to be convenient for people to engage it. So, you know, I'm someone who was not a political person at all when I started out. I, I was a rapper for 15 years and a city kid who had been displaced out of multiple neighborhoods, gone to multiple public schools, uh, ultimately just kind of learned to, to move up in like the corporate environment, but ultimately like have never felt comfortable in a lot of spaces and always felt like an outsider. And so when you feel that way, coming into anything, like even talking about government, if you come in not understanding it, it's very easy to feel intimidated to then be more withdrawn and not fully engage in it. So we think it's crucial that one, folks are educated in it, but also that we make it as convenient as possible for people to engage. Um, so we'll show some examples of what we've been doing in our office to do that. So th these are, uh, what you see it here and I'll go through it, are all new things that we brought to the 40th Ward upon election. So we do quarterly town halls. So we would do them in each quarter of the ward prior to COVID. Uh, once COVID showed up, we made sure that we were even more accessible and able for folks to, to kind of watch what we're doing from the comfort of their living room, office, basement, wherever you keep a computer nowadays. Uh, and so again, focusing a lot on education, what we deliver as government, what people can expect from us and, and really uh, provide ways for them to engage and provide feedback. So we have a community driven zoning process which Jeffrey uh, has termed and because he's been looking at it, we have the most directly democratic community driven zoning process in the city. So Jeffrey, if you want to provide a little bit of context for folks. Sure, and uh, I don't want to take up the whole night, but so for folks who aren't deep in the weeds on some of the stuff, zoning and zoning changes are one of the things in Chicago where aldermen have a lot of direct say. There are not laws, but longstanding legislative traditions that give alders a lot of power over zoning in their ward. And that historically has not been used in terribly transparent ways. So one of the things we wanted to do when we came in was make sure that anytime someone requests a change to any zoning in our ward, that knowledge is public, what they're asking to build is public, you know, you can get a, a set of plans for what's being proposed and all of that. And then you do a presentation where everyone in the ward um, has a couple of weeks to give feedback, you know, either on the night of the presentation or, or online. Um, and it took us a little while to sort of get all of those pieces built out, you know, initially we started doing like paper flyers in the neighborhood and you did the meeting at the ward office and now two years in we're on zoom the plans and the feedback are all hooked into Airtable, which displays right on our website things like that so like that's one of the areas where we have sort of been using the tools that are available uh, uh to make it a little more accessible and, and we've been seeing the results you know we can track and see how much feedback we get whenever someone requests a change and we're seeing that engagement go up over time so that's really been um, very positive for us. And we call it the most directly democratic just because those meetings are open and everyone in the 40th ward is invited to give feedback. There are other wards that do a good job doing outreach and soliciting public feedback. They tend to go through 
um, zoning councils or advisory boards or through neighborhood orgs that have development committees, things like that, um, which we invite to the table, but we always made, want to make sure there aren't, there's no gatekeeping. You know, our goal is to get feedback from residents of the ward directly rather than from a body that claims to represent the representative or the, the residents of the ward. Yep, absolutely. So looking at um, also our budget process. So the menu budget is $1.5 million that are appropriated to each ward to be able to figure out infrastructure repairs, you know, projects like uh, dog parks or art, public art. Um, so what we've done in the 40th ward office is we take a million dollars out of that menu budget and completely give that to the public and we call it the people's budget. Uh, or should I say we don't give the million dollars to the public, but we give the ability to decide what to do with the million dollars to the public. So that involves a, a multi month long process where neighbors can submit any ideas for where to spend the funds. We then look through the departments to check feasibility and then ultimately put it on a, a people's budget ballot and allow for a public vote that determines where those funds go and what share of those funds go to repairs. Uh, we also have a volunteer legislative team. So rather than us kind of going in and saying, here's what we're gonna draft, we bring in people to get their ideas, they help us with research, uh, and then also help us draft legislation. So that's something we are uh, very proud of. Uh, and then we also have our neighbor network. So during COVID, we identified that, uh, we didn't really have to identify, our neighbors needed help. We were in a pandemic and an economic depression where people couldn't pay rent, we're looking for food, where sewing masks or masks weren't available yet. So what we did is kind of created really a government mutual aid network. So we had neighbors who would do everything from bringing supplies to seniors who might need it to, uh, as I said, sewing masks and distributing up to 20,000 masks prior to them being readily available. We also have our shovel squad. So during the winter, we would engage neighbors to be able to shovel snow for those who needed it. Um, so we, we really, want to make sure that people understand that government is this living, breathing thing that, that helps build community. Uh, so we're proud of, of what we've been doing there. Uh, so let's talk budgets, because as we're looking through what open government is and how every year we've got this budget process, we also want to work to make sure that we're more effective in the budget process, but that we're also more transparent and able to help bring awareness to how the budget process works. So here's some background on the budget. And this is from a city council point of view to, as we provide history. So uh, the first thing that I put up there is that budgets aren't binary. Uh, you know, Typically the way it's presented to the public, there's like the mayor's budget and then are you pro or against the mayor's budget? And that framing isn't the most accurate to how it actually plays out. So in the city council, we've got 50 different alder persons, right? Alder people, they're there. They're. Now, the mayor's job in trying to pass a budget is to get 26 votes, any 26 votes out of those 50 to pass. Um, and there are dynamics that have been set up historically to kind of give a bit of an edge to the mayor as they're working to do that. So the mayor has 18 committee chairs. There are different committees that uh, cover subject matter uh, as far as different things that come before the city council. The committee chairs typically end up with a higher budget to work with. Uh, and staff to be able to not only um, run the committee process, but typically those employees have also helped out in the government offices as well. So it becomes this thing where there is a value to being a committee chair and that value ends up being traded typically and historically for this loyalty to a mayor's um, decision, right? So if a mayor is moving forward with something, uh, you can kind of look and see, okay, if you've got 18 committee chairs, those are roughly 18 votes you start out with in order to get to 26. That leaves only eight more that you've got to add out of the other 50. Now, on the other side of the ledger, if you're like us coming from a progressive or leftist standpoint, you've got 18 progressive uh, caucus members. So one would think that might be even, but that would be only in the situation where the caucus votes as a block. And I think we haven't seen that happen terribly often in the city council. And also out of those 18 progressive caucus members, three are committee chairs, right? So the reason why I frame all that is, it's not a versus more than who can get to 26 first out of the 50. And that's a, that's a much different conversation because when the rules of the game are different, there are different ways to be successful. 
So what we say or what I've seen looking at is that budgets are ultimately battles of finding consensus and of negotiation. So I believe that in order for us as a movement to be more successful in the budget process, we have to be good at listening and learning to the rest of the colleagues who may not share our perspective or ideology, right? So we have to learn where do our colleagues stand? What are their points of contention when looking at a budget based on their perspective? And if we're really good at that, then we can ultimately build enough consensus to get to 26 and have a different leverage point when it comes to passing a budget. So uh, kind of in, in discussing that framing, it was not always this way. So in the uh, 70s, 80s prior uh, to that time, the city council would present its own budget, the mayor would present his or her budget, uh, and then the two parties would ultimately negotiate on a budget or figure out the votes. Now, welcome to Chicago, where uh, when the first mayor daily came and kind of locked everything down, ultimately, even though the municipal code states that each co-equal branch of government presents their own budget, it stopped functioning that way. And it became where the mayor presents their budget. Ultimately, uh, at that time, there was the real hardcore rubber stamp of like 49 to 50 votes on everything the mayor presented. So there would be no need to actually have those two co-equal branches present budgets. So what we see in looking at how that's evolved over time, right? You've gone from uh, Mayor Daley to the second Mayor Daley, to even Rom having like these larger rubber stamp numbers to now seeing Mayor Lightfoot go to like your 30s or in the last budget, 29 votes to ultimately pass. So what that says is there's an independence there that we need to be building off of. So we wanna bring that old school back and have the council itself present its own budget to change the dynamics of how the conversation moves forward. Uh, now let's talk budgets as far as the public. So the premise here is when you think about budget public education, right? The government doesn't provide adequate education on how budgets work. Uh, when I'm being cynical, I believe that to be intentional, that you are not being able to be held accountable if people ultimately don't have that education. Um, engaging in the budget process as the public is a mixed bag. Every ward has its own process on how it works through a budget. Uh, the media tends to cover the drama intention in the budget conversations rather than the informational aspects of how it works. And the mayor ultimately is pitching her idea, right? So there's going to be a, a bias of someone who's presenting an idea as opposed to really providing um, accurate and unbiased information to folks. So that's kind of just the dynamics at play. Um, then there's thinking about different public budget perspectives. So many neighbors view budget appropriation in silos. And what I mean by that, and I kind of have the three bullet points, when you talk about police, the police department or the funding of the police department, um, if someone is someone who is pro-police or feels that police are public safety, that you need more police and more patrolling, they kind of view it just in that lens and independent of other departments when ultimately taxpayer dollars are the whole sum of the money that's used and they have to be appropriated to different departments. So when we engage in these conversations, rather than looking at the total budget, it ends up being in these silos about <clears throat> what do we do as far as police? Do we invest? Do we divest? When we talk about infrastructure and services, and by that I mean your streets and sanitation, your potholes, your tree trimming, your water department, uh, those are also different departments that I think don't get enough focus when it comes to budget, right? People will complain about how long it takes to fix a thing, but the conversations are never about funding those departments to be more effective in that role. Um, so I think this at times creates counterproductive framing. And what I mean, and kind of an example I have is a uh, defund, right? So I'm, I'm someone who's invested in divesting from the police department because we're talking about a $1.7 billion bu uh, budget that takes up 47% of the operating funds uh, that we have as a city. Now, if we were to talk about defund, divest, and strictly look at it from a CPD angle, uh, in the 40th Ward, you know, we've seen this with like the constituents here. People view that term as like, oh, defund means you're going to gut it completely. And we look at, you know, police as public safety. So then you get into a conversation that ultimately takes you away from where you're trying to get, which is let's talk about where the budget funding should go. 
So the, the term that we've been kind of using in the 40th Ward and talking about this is budget reprioritization. That rather than looking at it in a silo about each department, you want to look at it holistically and say, where would you put all your funds? Because the premise I have there in presenting it that way is that no one would fund any department at a 40% level if you had to look at every other department and where funding needed to go. And if you ultimately have that conversation, you don't get stuck into the uh, how we view one department or the other, rather than how do you actually fund everything you need to with the finite amount of funds that you have coming in currently. So we think that in order to find consensus, not only with the city council, but with the public, that we need to be able to reframe this conversation and talk more about the data and the numbers rather than sometimes the emotion that gets caught up depending on the department we're talking about. So this is where we need your help. Um, as we've been having the conversations with our colleagues in city council, I wanna get to the point where I can find out from them, how would you reprioritize and rebalance this whole budget? Because if we get that information from each of the city council members, then we have a much better starting point when it comes to getting to 26, because it would give us more context as to how do people view what departments should be funded? What's the range where you find the most amount of consensus? And then that can help us get to a point where we actually have more leverage and can get to a budget as a city council that we can present knowing there's support behind it. So uh, developed by Jeffrey Cubbage, our director of policy, uh, the purpose has been that, find a way to engage in budget conversations uh, and to capture feedback from alders and the public. Uh, so what we would need and what we need help with, and that's what we're asking all the uh, brilliant folks on, the, on this call and those who might see us after and reach out, is to create a user-friendly interface that can be placed on a landing page. So someone could affect kind of like tool around with the different departments and see where they would allocate funding. Uh, we also want to get the ability to capture snapshot data of someone's completed balance, right? So somebody's playing around with the numbers, they decide this looks like a, a budget I could get behind. We wanna be able to be like, click, save that. So we know that is, that is where you're at when you're landing on it. And then also potentially with that data, be able to deduce what a common starting point or a range of negotiation might be. So these are kind of like the concepts of what we're trying to do. What I wanna do now is pass it off to Jeffrey, who's got the Excel spreadsheet tool that we've created to give you like the rough outline of what we're trying to do and hopefully uh, work with any who are interested in creating something that's way more user-friendly because that would put us in much better position, especially in this budget process, to make sure that we're actually um, able to move in a way that isn't just talking about what we'd like to see, but also getting the numbers necessary to get that accomplished. So I will stop share here so that Jeffrey can uh, share his screen. Awesome, thank you. And then what I'm gonna do is three things. I'm gonna give you a caveat, and then I'm gonna show you the tool, and then I'm gonna talk through a couple of use cases for the tool, um, and then turn it over to your tender mercies. So let me share screen real quick, just so you can see what we're talking about. Um, the caveat is that this is embarrassing, right? This is not programmed, this is an Excel spreadsheet. Uh, Alderman Vasquez gets three staffers. None of us are programmers, uh, but I know some very old school Excel, Excel from the last decade. And when he started talking about this, I was like, I think I can build like a tool that, that does what you wanna do. It just won't be the most user-friendly. So what you're looking at here is a spreadsheet designed to do exactly that. It shows all of the departments that receive funding from the city. Um, it shows what they got last year, what their budget appropriation was as a share of the total appropriated dollars. So it's not as a share of the total city budget. There are other revenue sources that go to other things in the city, right? There are funds that pay for um, pensions, things like that. There are fixed expenses that don't come into it. Um, once you've subtracted all of those things away and you come down to what is left that are appropriable funds that go to actual city departments. That's the number we're talking about. That's the pot of money we're talking about here. We're looking right now at the 2021 appropriations. Um, we also ran some numbers to do a rough projection of 2022. Um, that number will change. We know that number will change as we get better data from Office of Budget Management uh, through the summer. We'll know more and more what our 2022 revenues are gonna look like and what the appropriable share of them is gonna look like. So that'll change. But um, the tool we made was based on percentages and that's because we wanted to have something you could turn over um, 
in this early version, this kind of alpha version for Dre to share with uh, Alderman Vasquez to share with um, his fellow alders, you know, to just sort of encourage them to start thinking, okay, really play around with this. What would it look like if you were funding your perfect city budget? But what we want to do now is take it several steps further and make it something that's publicly shareable um, and where we can capture the data and then uh, put all of it in one place so we can start running some averages, see like what is the consensus, you know, in the 40th ward in the city of Chicago, if other alders want to share it with their ward explicitly, you know, are there, uh, do we have a general consensus of what people in Chicago want a budget to look like or not? Um, so what we built to that end was this tool, which like I said, it's Excel based and it has a couple of flaws. It, it is Excel based and it uses the spin button. So it not, you can't do it in Google Sheets. You got to do it in desktop Excel. And depending on how you have your default column width set, these buttons may not line up nicely. So lots of problems already, but how it's set up to work is just, you've got every single department. You can already see what was allocated to them last year. And then if you start playing with the sliders, you know, if you want to say, all right, hey, we just had a pandemic. DPH needs to be funded way better than it was last year. You can start clicking. You can click and hold. Y'all you know, can see the numbers start going up and you'll see the sliders on the screen show up too. There seems to be a little bit of lag because I'm screen sharing probably. Yeah, but there you go. So it's very, it's designed to make it a little easier both for alders and for folks who don't interact with the budget at all to sort of visualize, oh, okay, last year during COVID, literally only 6%, 6.5% of the city's appropriable funds went to the Department of Public Health, right? So like our COVID-19 response, whether you liked it or not, that's what six and a half percent of the city's appropriable funds buys you. So if you're thinking that maybe wasn't adequate, you just lean on the slider a little longer, put the budget up. And up here, it tracks what's left. It tracks how many dollars are left. It'll turn red once you've gone over and all of that. So it's a tool for people to play around until they're satisfied with, okay, what does my ideal city budget look like? And then I kind of started talking about this earlier, but the three use cases we basically had in mind was number one for alders, right? Literally for alders who want to talk about budget with the mayor's office or with OBM in a serious way, or for alders who want to start talking about, hey, if we did write our own budget, what's the framework we're starting with? Like, what, what do all the line items need to add up to? Um, because there's a lot of work that goes beyond just these rough percentages, obviously, but this gets them a starting point. So number one is for alders to have a tool that they can play around with, manipulate, and talk about in groups. Number two is for us to have a tool we can share with residents of the ward, right? Um, uh, just like with the, uh, the zoning request we were talking about earlier, our goal is always to be as representative as we can, um, and the more ward residents tell us exactly what their ideal budget looks like, the better we can represent them in budget negotiations and in drafting of any budget, whether it's the mayor's or whether it's someone else's, right? That gives us the tool to say, hey, here is exactly what the neighbors in the 40th ward want. Why should I vote for something that's not that? Um, and then the third would be for other alders to do the same, you know, so that, uh, and that would require some kind of tagging or different URLs or some way to keep the data separate, right? So that you know who has responded and where they found the, where they found the tool. Uh, are they responding to the 40th ward version of it? Are they responding to a citywide version? Are they responding to some other ward version? Um, and then the last one would be, um, uh, uh, exactly that, a citywide, it would be if we just take everyone who's ever responded to this, whether it's an alderman, a resident of the 40th ward, or a resident of somewhere else, what does that average out to? What is the what is the ideal city budget for uh, everyone who uses this tool end up looking like? So um, as you can see, it's, it's, it's got a few steps to get from what we have here, because right now this is something that, and again, what we've played with so far is we literally email the Excel file to someone, they open it in Excel on their desktop, they make the columns line up if the columns aren't lining up right. They set it to where they think they want their ideal budget, at least the start of discussions to be at, and then they email it back and then I rename it with their name and we save it. So it is not a neat process and we're looking to streamline that. Um, and also just to get more ideas of how we could then use the data once it comes in, right? Because you are gonna get a lot of feedback from a lot of people, I think, once you put a tool like this out in the wild. So, you know, obviously looking at what the average desired budget, budget is, is interesting, but, you know, are there ways to set parameters, be like, where do the vast majority of people fall? What are the extreme outliers? You know, at what point are people, what's the range at which you see a lot of flex? What are the ranges where there are hard stops where nobody is funding a department below this much or nobody is funding a department above that much, things like that, so. Um, that's the tool as it exists. That's sort of the vision for where we want it to go. I think unless Alderman Vasquez wants to add to that, let me turn it over for the Q&A folks or for the, the uh, moderators to let you know where we're going next. Yeah, I got two, two quick things just to give people timeline. So typically the budget process begins around August to then figure out by November what a budget would look like. So that should give you a little bit of timeline of how we want to be able to operate to have some of those answers in advance of that process. 
And also, it might not surprise you that some city council members are a bit Luddite in nature and have zero idea how to operate even a spreadsheet. So part of our, our trying to make things really convenient is that. Like if I send like one of my colleagues a spreadsheet and say, hey, let me know when you get back, they're not even clicking it. They're going to look at that thing and go, I have zero idea what to do. I think I'm going to mess something up and we're not able to get that information. So yeah, that's ultimately all of it. Thank you so much for the time for the presentation. Please feel free to share any feedback and ask literally any questions about anything at all. I Open government is what it is. I'm more than happy to answer any questions folks have. And real quick, just because there is one already in the chat about how much is grant funding, just to give some clarity, the, the numbers that you're looking at here, the, this spreadsheet does include the grant funding, um, because this is sort of the general 35,000 foot view. Some departments are much more heavily grant funded than others, um, but the vast majority of them use enough of the corporate funds, which is sort of the, the general revenue pot that it's relatively fungible. There, there are gonna be a few like hard stop things like a decent chunk of CDOT's, uh, the Department of Transportation's budget is always gonna come out of the vehicle tax, the, the gas tax and the city stickers um, because you can't use those for other things. They're, they are dedicated revenue that says you use a vehicle, therefore you're paying for the upkeep of streets. So there are some minimum floors and maximum ceilings um, for some of these departments just because they receive revenue that literally can't be spent anywhere else. Um, so on our back end, we do take that into account when we look at these rough numbers, when we look at, okay, roughly each department says this is where they want to go, we will be doing things like, oh, everyone wants to see CDOT's budget go up. We already know CDOT is getting this much, so we only have to move this much more over from other funds, things like that. So when you get down into the individual line items that you're cutting or adding or moving around, it does get messier and the grant funding does become relevant. But for purposes of this tool, I would not tell individual residents or even individual alders to stress, is this coming from general fund or not? Just show me the percentages you want as a breakdown of all appropriable funds. And then on the back end, we'll work with which individual appropriable funds need to go to which departments to get you as close as possible to that. So really good question. I, I really appreciate that because there is a lot more going on than this tool can capture. But um, our, our goal is user-friendly and simplicity. Um, and then we have much more um, funky looking spreadsheets on the back end. I, I like that you got all the props for this broad, uh, spreadsheet. So props on that one. <laughs> People and, are being very generous. I appreciate yeah. it. And I guess Joel and uh, Ryan, if y'all want to like chair, that'd be great. I'm muted. Sorry about that. Okay, so yeah, we're gonna get the Q and A started. Um, I guess, of course, our code of conduct still does apply. So feel free to ask questions, but within reason. Um, I'm what I'm gonna do is there's already a question in the chat that I'm going to. Um, potentially take. Now, if you want to actually ask your question directly, feel free to come off of mute. Otherwise, if you feel more comfortable just typing it into the chat, we can call them that way, but we will say the person's name so that way everyone is not like a free-for-all and we know who um, question we're taking at the moment. So, I'm sorry, there was a request for captions. I don't know if that's something y'all have or can turn on. I, I'm sorry, I didn't see that soon. Oh, no, okay. Joel, do you have? I will poke around while, while you're doing the question. <laughs> Okay. Let's see. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and take the first question from John. John, would you like me to read your question or would you want to ask directly? Okay, so I'll take the question for John. So if the Zoom dancer from earlier tonight is any indication, then authentication proof read voter fraud will be a huge point of contention and argument for such a tool. Are you worried about this, or do you think even if it's just focused on the alderman use case, then that's still a win? I.e., if we don't open the can of worms of public data collection use case, how valuable would this be? Yeah, uh, thank you. It's a really great question. So ideally, or where we wanted to start from was the alders. It's being able to identify out of those 50, where do they land? So then ultimately, myself as like a pitch person, can talk to all the colleagues, figure out where we land and kind of be able to, to really navigate that uh, better than we currently do. Um, so what we saw then is, oh, we could also use this for the community or for the neighbors to hear that. So I think it's a good tool to get feedback, but I think to your point, we wouldn't necessarily uh, like live and die by what the results of that would be. I do think it's an interesting point and a good argument for at least some sort of, you know, 
um, data collection or user verification. And again, now we are we're already talking about two different versions, right? One for alders and one for people uh, who are just accessing it. <laughs> the city. Aren't people. Um, that either. said, it's a really good one to bring up because we actually saw something somewhat similar to this last season, right? Remember, uh, some of y'all may remember the mayor's office rolled out a similar tool. It was a little less uh, sophisticated. It was basically like 10% brackets or something like that that you could pick. And it, it only had the largest departments. It didn't include all of them, but it was somewhat similar. It encouraged people to like give an idea of roughly what your budget breakdown would look like. Lots of people responded, you know, they got what a couple thousand respondents, something like that. Um, and they basically discounted it. They said the respondents aren't representative. They're only from, you know, mostly the north side of the city. The, this tool's not relevant. We aren't going to do anything that's in it because it didn't give the results they want. Yeah, you know, it, okay. it, it, so the people radical wanted to drastically cut it. the police budget and increase budgets like streets and sanitation, Department of Public Health, all that. So um, we've absolutely seen exactly the issue you're talking about, where you you get people who get the data and then say, ah, oh, the data is worthless anyway, and we don't want to do that. So yeah, the user verification is definitely something we probably want to wrestle with. Thank you. Someone just threw the uh, link in there, Jacob. Awesome. Yeah. So so you can see, like, the mayor's sort of done something like this and didn't like the numbers that their office got. Um, so. Yep, that was a fun conversation that day. Yeah. Uh, so, sorry, Ryan. Okay, um, so I'm going to go ahead and let Howard take the next question. Howard, do you want to come off mute? Yeah. It seems to me that this is, budgeting is a common problem that not only governments have, but, you know, businesses and putting together budgets it being a common process, has there been any look to see what, you know, solutions already exist out there and, or if any solutions can be uh, modified to meet your needs? So I, I know I had tried figuring out something similar and was really struggling to find something that, um, either if there was something out there that we could then adapt to use. Um, so I think that's what ultimately led it, but I don't know, Jeffrey, if you had any well, the budget tools exist, certainly. I mean, Office of Budget and Management, which is the department that basically prepares each year's budget for the mayor, they certainly have software that they use for that. Whether it can do this kind of like public facing stuff, I don't know. And I don't honestly think that it's really set up to. Um, that, and then the, the second issue that you're going to run into is, you know, if a group of alders is making noise about, hey, we're not sure we like how the last budget process went. We're thinking maybe we should reach out to our constituents and get them more involved in drafting. That's an idea that sounds really good to constituents. It's not necessarily an idea that the administration is going to then give you a bunch of software licenses and uh, administrator permissions to go ahead and do, um, or it'll take you a long time to get there and you won't have the tool in time. So there are there are tools that the city has that we may not necessarily have the access we need to, to use. Um, and uh, like I said, I don't know that they're going to be able to do the kind of engagement uh, uh, feedback sol solicitation that we want. Mm -hmm. But I'm sure there are tools that can do the survey better than Excel. Uh, I can say that with confidence. OK, so we'll take the next question from Daniel. Daniel, would you like to um, ask your question directly or want me to just go ahead and do it for you? Okay, so is there another version of the spreadsheet showing actual dollars rather, rather than percent total? So in such a spreadsheet, could dedicated dollars, for example, highway tax be shown in one color with discretionary dollars shown in another color? Oh, got it. Yeah, that, uh, that would be a step further. So yeah, I was going to say this does show you the dollar amount. Um, and again, that's based on our estimate of the 2020 available funds, which uh, may change, will change, um, for sure. But yeah, it does show the dollar amount. So you can see right now you're, you know, half a percentage is what is that 405 or uh, that's cal commas are hard 40,000 or 40 million. Uh, 40 million is every, every half percentage point is about 40 million, 40, 40.5 million. So um, it does show you the real dollar amount, but um, no, it does, it's not set up to show you which ones are coming from which funds yet. There are some back end Excel hassles with that. They are not insurmountable. We could definitely do it, but I think we wanted to see how far it made sense to take this tool in Excel versus how far, how soon it made sense to switch to a different tool before we started plugging in anything more than we already had, if that makes sense. Great. Okay. So um, next question from Nick. Nick, would you like to come off mute? Hey, yeah. Uh, so this kind of ties back to what you talked about a couple of questions ago about people collecting the data and then not liking what they see. Um, 
you know, I just wonder, even though this isn't technically voting, it still has a lot of influence on what you guys execute as a government. Um, I wonder if people who aren't as tech savvy uh, may feel left out. Um, I'm sure you guys have already run into that in the past. Uh, I guess, how do you kind of address those concerns? Well, I think that's 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 been a lot of the driving force in trying to figure out how to make this more user-friendly, right? Because as challenging as it might be to even use this process, to remove that and just be like, how do you talk to your average neighbor next door about the budget and picturing it? That's incredibly challenging, right? So I think we're trying to identify tools that would make it easier for like myself or someone on the team to be able to have those conversations and really have it in a way where people can visualize what we're talking about to then have more productive conversations. So yeah, yeah. I, I think it's absolutely a concern and I think that's part of what we're trying to address. Yeah, and I think it ties into a lot of what uh, Alderman Vasquez was talking about earlier in the slideshow. A lot of the initiatives we do, you do have that double-edged sword, right, where we are trying very hard to make the ward office more transparent and more accountable. And a lot of the best tools to do that are digital, which inherently and inevitably leaves people out, which is the exact opposite of what we're trying to do. So it's something we wrestle with a lot on the zoning front as well. It's why we do like door-to-door -door flyer outreach as well as the digital stuff. Um, Mm -hmm. It's not perfect and we know it's not perfect. So we try really hard, whether it's this tool, the budget tool, the feedback we get on zoning or anything else. Um, we try to be very conscious that a straw poll is great. It is not the entire view of the entire community, right? It, it is a useful guideline. It definitely tells you where you need to be going, um, but you then need other tools and things we do, you know, we do the town halls and we do outreach like that. So those quarterly town halls in budget season always have a large budget section in them where we can get feedback from folks who just come in person, don't do any of the digital stuff. Um, so yeah, we would be using any feedback that we got from this as guidelines, you know, as a starter to a conversation, but trying to yeah, be very cognizant. And also like from my experience of work in retail, right? Like trying to teach a person to use a smartphone, trust, it has got its own challenges when like, you know, somebody's great grandparent wants to get a phone. So I think being able to provide those tools, even for like staff or volunteers to be able to say, hey, I'm more than happy to walk you through it. Like, let's talk through it and be able to like show that yeah. actually helps in making it more accessible too. And I will say we have had luck with digital forms like on tablets or things like that, that if staff is interacting with someone in person, you can usually get them to go through the form, fill it out and get the right results out of it, right? Like we, you know, when we do constituent service requests, literally just someone walking into the ward office with an issue. Um, those used to be like a pen and paper, just take notes, hand it over. Now there's a form and that's a form you can go door to door with on tablets. And even folks who would never go to the website would never fill that out on their own when they've got the boxes in front of you, in front of them. And someone from staff is saying, hey, here's where you put your name. Here's where we put your email. This is why we need this information. They get it, right? So you can do that kind of outreach with digital tools in the field as well. Okay, um, next question from Catherine. Oh, oh it's, that's perfectly fine, Catherine. Um, let us know if you wanna come out off of mute and talk it through with us, or if you prefer to skip over uh, you now. Awesome, also like if folks have questions that are completely independent of, of what we brought, right? how government works chicago like all the many feel free to ask those as well like i'm more than happy to to make sure we're answering that it, it doesn't have to be about this clearly that's our self-interest but i want to make sure that any questions that folks have we can we can tackle okay so looks like we have a question from andrew mm -hmm. hi Hey. So, yeah, uh, you were talking earlier about when you're talking about open government stuff, you mentioned a bit about your zoning uh, openings. And I wanted to know uh, how you deal uh, with the democratic process in that case with, uh, I guess I'll use an inflammatory perhaps word here, uh, NIMBYs and the like when, when we're dealing with zoning considerations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it's actually really interesting, right? Like, so part of it, you know, part of it is I came into office saying we were going to bring affordability because of my own personal experience and things that I'm passionate about. So we walk in with people already kind of knowing some of that. Um, but what we've seen that plays out in the democratic process is people might hate a project for a multitude of reasons, meaning some people want more parking. Uh, that's often what comes up. Other people might say we want more affordability. Uh, that actually happens more often than one would think. I think part of it is because they know that's part of what I ran on. 
Um, but what we typically do is we have the, the week or two of getting the feedback. And one of three things will happen. Either thumbs up, neighbors are in support, it moves forward. Uh, neighbors are in opposition, all right. Neighbors are in opposition, they say no, we say we don't support it, that ends the conversation. Most often though, we get the feedback, we share the feedback with the, per the developer making the proposal, and we might kind of make some suggestions and say, look, you get, you have, you know, 20% of people who don't like parking, you've got 20% of people that think we need more affordability. If we lean to add more affordability, we then have a larger share of people who are supportive, and that helps us get to the finish line. So it does ultimately help me position things so that we're able to get more affordability in a lot of instances. So we looks like we have time for about one more question. Um, Felipe, would you like me to ask your question, or you, do you want to come off mute? Okay, so would it be possible to drive engagement through CPS to drive broader engagement? So while teaching kids how to use Excel, use tools to engage with parents and guardians and neighbors? That is an awesome question. And absolutely, if you create a tool that's like that user-friendly, we would be able to multiply the number of people who get to use that tool and can engage with others with that tool. So yeah, I, I love that. Then I think that is the last question we have. Joel, let me know if you want to take yeah. any more or if you want to get ready to wrap it up. Oh, um, I don't know. Uh, I see Josh has dropped some links in there. Do you want to talk about any of those, Josh? Gotcha. So I had one, I had one. So I know that I've often heard of people like hiding things in budgets, right? And especially a budget as massive as the city budget. Yep. There's a lot of a lot of closets you could put stuff in. And uh, I just wondered, do you have any strategies to try and Sherlock that stuff? To try and find yeah, 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 yes. And I think I think for us, we start with the most glaring one, which is a police budget, right? Like prior to you know us coming to office settlements. There's about $800 million that the city has paid out in police misconduct settlements, an average of about $52 million a year. And those were not under the police budget. They were actually under like the Department of Law because the Department of Law would be the one taking the cases on. So that changed uh, under this term, where now it's part of the CPD budget. But CPD is very much where we look and kind of focus those efforts. And so I will pass it off to Jeffrey, who will tell you on what we've been doing because that is where we want to like focus a lot of our efforts for that reason. Yeah, I'm also going to digress a tiny bit because the, so the, the CPD budget, uh, so one of the things that we wanted to do, and we are doing, this is something our, our ledge team has um, been working on, is looking, the, forget the budget spreadsheet for a minute, imagine just the CPD budget and that can be broken down within the city's budget. The budget document that actually passes does allocate specific amounts of funds and more importantly a set number of staff at various pay levels to each of the sub departments within uh, all of the city departments it's it's easy to look at the cpd budget as an example because it's so big so you see the breakdown of this is a department categorization this is a sub department categorization this is a unit within that department categorization um, so we have that as a spreadsheet similar to the one you saw where it just shows you down the breakdown by which units are receiving the most funding and what we've done is we've sort of put that into a document that says, here's each unit, here's what the funding they receive is, here's nominally what they do, right? Here is their mission statement according to CPD in the organizing documents of CPD. Um, what does the data on that look like? And there are a lot of different things you can look at, right? You can look at arrest records, you can look at how many times the unit has been deployed. You can do things like that to see what are we paying for, what are we getting? Um, so like. Easy examples are things like, okay, how much do we pay for a Marine patrol? How many like Marine crimes actually happen year to year? And I'm not saying that as an example because I, I wanna say our Marine patrol is bad. Like you might see, hey, look, there's a lot of crime happening on the lake and we only have two boats to address it. Maybe they need more, right? It goes both ways. But so we do that. We do try to do those kinds of things. Backing up to the original question, which is how do you avoid finding things or how do you find things that are hidden in the budget? Um, a couple of ways. One is comparison, right? Look at the departments year to year and see where you see a big change. Um, one of the big changes this year, CPD didn't get as big of a bump as it usually did. And that's because the newly created Office of Public Safety 
received a huge funding increase. They're doing the same job, right? It is people who are process, it is people doing desk work on behalf of the police, but they shifted the budget to a different department. And that was a really, as soon as you put the numbers side by side from uh, 2019 to 2020, that just jumps right out at you. The other thing is to look at new language that goes into the municipal code. So every budget season, there are three big pieces of legislation that passes. The biggest is the appropriations ordinance, and that is like the spreadsheet, the PDF with all of the numbers of everything that's spent. There's also a revenue ordinance, which is if any new revenue is created, right? We come up with a new fee, there's a new tax that can be done at the municipal levels. Those will have their own new statutory language that goes in a standalone ordinance. The third is called the management ordinance, and that amends the municipal code, the sections of the municipal code that define what each department does and what powers the commissioner has. So if, um, you know, for example, the city wanted to like do a housing first model, right? The city was gonna say the commissioner of housing is now authorized to buy and build as much housing as they need to end homelessness in Chicago. That would require new statutory authority, new statutory authority that would go in the management ordinance as an amendment to the already existing section of the municipal code that defines the commissioner of housing's powers. So when you look at the management ordinance, if you see a bunch of new powers assigned to a department, you're probably gonna see a corresponding increase in funding. If you see a bunch of stuff struck from a department, hopefully you're gonna see a decrease in funding, or if you don't, there's probably a reason for that. So those are some of the things that we look for year to year in the budgets. Great, so we have one final question from Catherine. Um, are there general ranges of budget that each department asks for? So would it be more appropriate to open some expectation other than just pass to public to have more ideas for those who are not as knowledgeable about how the state should run? So welcome to Chicago, home of the closed door conversations. So typically what occurs is the departments, they have this process independent of the city council. The mayor will say, here's where you're going to start. Here's where you're working with. Here's what I expect back. Those departments then interact and they basically lobby for the amounts that they feel that they need. Then the mayor at, at that point, once they figure that out, they go, well, this is the budget we're going to give y'all. So work within these means. We're making the arbitrary decisions of where it lands. Now, when it comes to the city council trying to talk to those departments, during budget season, once that process has occurred, they are then tight-lipped, meaning we'll go to departments and say, look, we know that when you need a tree trim, you take it takes a year and a half to actually get that done. So clearly, you all need some more funding or like one person per garbage truck. There's a problem there. How much do you all need? And then they go, oh, well, you know, we went to the process and then we should, you know, it's in the budget. Like they will not do it because ultimately in Chicago, there is that much fear of a mayor to be able to cut your job, right? So that in, in effect creates a roadblock to actually having that conversation. Something that I had thought about is really being proactive and asking them like months in advance, what are you thinking? Even then the best that they'll do is they'll say, yeah, we could use some help here, but they won't provide any details because they are very concerned that if that were to get out that they had a commissioner, deputy, deputy commissioners were the ones speaking on that, that they would no longer be the commissioner or deputy commissioner next year. Uh, so that is part of the reason why we have to figure out ways to do it independently and have these conversations. Yeah, so we, we absolutely know the departments make asks and they get some of what they ask for, not all. City council does not get to see those asks. That is maybe a thing you'll get a piece of it as a request through the chair deep into budget season once the budget's already been presented. But in terms of like the process that goes into writing the budget, closed door, even as far as alders are concerned, you know, that's, that's not, we don't see their justifications for what they want. We just see when the mayor submits the proposed budget, we see how much they're asking for and what it goes towards. Yeah, it's also uh, why you want the same, the same information you all see. It's, it's, we see the same PDF as the public at the same time. Well, and it's also why we want to bring the old school back where the council presents its own budget, because if there's two budgets that are being presented, then it is in the best interest of those departments to get their ask on of both budgets. Right now they're figuring out how to triangulate once you change the model of a mayor just introducing it on their own. So that is part of the reason why we're building kind of the, the legislative muscle and exercising that muscle to get better year over year as a city council and then ultimately change the way this stuff works. And I think that is it for our question. So Audubon mm. Gospelers, Jeff, thank you for joining us. Yeah. Now we are in our post live stream Zoom link already, so you don't have to go and, and join a different room. So we're gonna stick around here for um, 
some introductions, the chat, and then of course to go into breakout groups. So Joel, I don't know if you have anything you want to add. Oh, I just wanted to say um, before we totally switch, uh, folks from the 40th Ward, what should uh, what should folks do if they want to continue this conversation um, and, uh, and and get going and do some stuff with this tool? Absolutely. Uh, here we go with. Oh, here we, go. we also need yeah. help with not, all of this stuff if you're not um, interested in this one we got other stuff <laughs> yeah but also here's a way to get connected with us so you've got the 40th ward.org if you want to take a screenshot knock yourselves out here's the phone number the facebook the instagram and the twitter and you can hit us at info at andre at jeffrey.cubbage at 40th ward.org um we really do mean we we really believe open government and being that accessible People that have DM'd me on Twitter know that. So absolutely feel free to reach out. We're more than happy to help. And thank you for the help and the opportunity to present.